Good evening, good evening. Uh, tonight's lesson is uh, created for God's purpose. Now, this is our fifth lesson, and so far, every one of them have been on the creation, and I know that God's creation is important, but sometimes uh, the lessons kind of get a little repetitive, so um, some of the material that we've gone over in the last uh, four uh, Sunday school lessons, I won't repeat that tonight, but I'll try to bring out the high points here of the lesson. Um, it, it talks about God has a good purpose for every aspect of creation. Uh, you know, God created everything in balance, and as long as we uh, do what we were created to do, things have a tendency to go well. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And I'm, I'm so glad that I've got a God that has, number one, he has a purpose for me, and number two, that he thinks about me. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's hard not to serve God when you think of him as a loving father and a, a father that has a good plan for you, and that's what he is. Uh, the lesson overview says, one of the most amazing facts about planet Earth is that it is so uh, uniquely suited to sustain uh, all the life forms found on it, humans, animals, and plants. With all this, uh, the searching that astronomers have done thus far, nothing, uh, there's nothing out there to equal uh, the planet Earth and they've not been able to find anything else that's compatible to sustain life like Earth has been. It is easy to think the, that planet Earth belongs to us, but in fact it belongs to God who created it, and it, it's to be for his own pleasure and his own glory. God is the one who made planet Earth well suited to sustain all life forms found on it. This lesson emphasizes the fact that God has a good purpose for everything that he created and for our own good, and we are wise to recognize this and worship God as a creator. And uh, sometimes I think that Christians take for granted, well, everybody knows that God created the world. <laughs> Not in the day you live in today. A lot of people are worshiping rocks and trees and everything but God or false gods, idols. But, uh, you know, uh, that, that when they worship rocks and trees, that's not a God. That's, that, that's not the creator. That's the creation. So, you know, people need prayer today. Uh, the lesson outline, it says creation declares God's glory. And it has uh, the testimony of creation is the first part. And all of these scriptures talk about the sun, the moon, uh, the stars, and everything that God made. Especially if you go outside at night, uh, get away from all the lights and, and just gaze up and look into the heavens, you'll see what a beautiful portrait that God has created for us to live in the middle of. Yeah, the, and then the second part is the testimony of God's word. Uh, these scriptures are Psalm 19, 7 through 14. And uh, these scriptures tell us about the law, the testimony all of God's statutes, and uh, it just lets us know that uh, we need to love God's Word because it's a Word when we study it that's going to show us the things that are wrong in our life so we can be more pleasing to the Lord. Uh, the second part of the outline is God created, uh, or we are created to love God. This is found in Micah 6, 8 and Mark chapter 12, 28 through 31. The question is, what does God require? People say, well, what does the Lord want us to do? Well, these scriptures will tell you. It says that God requires justice, mercy, and humility. And the second part of that outline is the greatest commandment. We know what the greatest commandment is, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, body, soul, everything that is in us. And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And the third part of the outline says, created to acknowledge and worship God. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this. We were created to worship God. We were created for his pleasure so he could have fellowship with us. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. 
The first part of this outline says God is made known. This is verses 18 through 20. It talks about God's righteousness and how he made everything seen and unseen. And uh, people say, well, I don't, I don't believe in what I can't see. You can't see the wind, but you believe in it. And they tell you a tornado's headed right straight towards your house. You'll take cover, I guarantee you. Uh, so, you know, the wind is a powerful force, but we don't see the wind. The second part of, uh, of that part three of the outline says God rejected. And today, there are a lot of people who do. They totally reject God. They refuse to believe in him. They say, oh, I don't believe in a God. Well, just because you don't believe doesn't make him any less real. Uh, amen. So it, it says uh, people had uh, hearts that were dark. Uh, these scriptures talk about un, uh, unthankful people, um, uh, rebellious people. Kind of sounds like the day that we're living in today, unthankful, ungodly, unholy. The scriptures tell us about these days. And, and uh and we certainly have seen a generation like that. The golden text, Romans 1 and 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and the Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Uh, I, you know, the scripture, it, it doesn't escape me. The scripture says, Thou art inexcusable, O man. He said, well, why don't you think so-and-so comes to church or serves the Lord? Because they don't want to. There's no excuse for them not to. They know about God. They know about his son. They know when church is going to be taking place. And most of them, every time they've gotten trouble in their life, they call on God. And God answers because he's merciful and good. And then after he gets them out of a slam or a bind, then they have a tendency to forget God again. But it's without excuse. The Lord says, thou art inexcusable. Oh, man. So let's go to the teaching goals here. Uh, it says, um, to impress on our minds the biblical truth that God created everything for his own glory, pleasure, and purpose. And the second teaching goal is to influence attitudes, to be grateful to God for allowing us to live on planet Earth and to enjoy the benefits of God's creation, which sustains our life. And the third part is to influence behavior. Seeing that humans were created by God to acknowledge and worship him for his glory and for our benefit, uh, you know, we should, we should be grateful every day. Every day that you wake up, we should be grateful for the things God provides for us and the things he does for our benefits. And we need to live for God by faith in Jesus Christ. The historical literary background. This lesson is based on Psalm chapter 19, a well-known psalm by David, almost 3,000 years old. Also, the words of the prophet Micah from 740 to 700 B.C. and the words of Jesus told by Mark, a disciple of Jesus and a close associate of the apostles and especially close to Peter and Paul and the apostle Paul's letters that were written to Romans uh, the Romans in the winter of A.D. 57 and 58. While many today think that it is irrelevant to believe in God and seek a personal relationship with him, all of the sources for this lesson testify that the human experience uh, of God for those who acknowledge and worship him has remained the same over thousands of years of human history. We can know God and his purpose for our existence. Uh, in Revelation, uh, and I'll just give you one that you can look up and for food for thought. When you talk about our existence and how God um, intended things to be for us, you could read Revelation chapter 4, verse uh, 11. Psalm 19 and 1, let's go to the scriptures and start reading here. It said, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows all of his handiwork. Uh, you know, when I lived in Pontotoc for 10 years and we lived out in a field uh, away from all the lights and and uh, we had a big patio out back and I would go out there and I would just lay back on the long furniture and just gaze. They, they call them stargazers. You sit there for an hour, two hours at a time. 
And I would watch the stars, look at all the things God had created. Every now and then, you would see one star that would float across in the, mid in the midst of all the rest. It was moving, even though everything else was sitting perfectly still. And, um, you know, I, I just found it amazing how God has everything in order and in line like that. Uh, they call them fast-tracking stars. Sometimes I, maybe you would enjoy doing that, uh, going out and just fixate on one place in the sky, look at one bright star and get your eyes fixed and just sit there for maybe 30 or 40 minutes. You'll be surprised what you see move in the heavens out there. God has done some amazing things. It says, day unto day utter speech and night to night reveals knowledge. That's because God has from day to day I mean, we can trust that this morning the sun came up, tomorrow morning the sun's coming up, and there's a moon and there's stars at night. They're going to be there tonight. They're going to be there tomorrow night. Why? God has perfectly balanced everything here in this creation. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Creation, everything about it proclaims that there is a creator. Uh, it says, their line has gone, uh, gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. So our, our solar system literally, uh, it's like God built a place to house the sun because the sun's right in the middle of it and everything revolves around the sun. And the track that those planets follow if they were to move one way or the other, they would burn up or they would freeze to death. Everything is perfectly in balance. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, and the testimony of the Lord, uh, Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. All of these are adjectives for God. He's perfect, he's clean, he's true, uh, he's righteous. Whatever he says in his word, you can take it to the bank, you can believe it. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. He, why, why do we call him our redeemer? Because he paid a debt we couldn't pay. He paid our sin debt. He bought us back, literally. He redeemed us from, from everlasting torment. When you get saved, that's what he's redeemed you from. Micah 6 and 8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God. Mark 12 and 30 says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first commandment. So above everything that we know, we should love God supremely. And people say, well, the Bible is so uh, full of all these rules and regulations. And if you will follow that one commandment right there, to love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, strength, everything else is just going to fall right into place for you because that's the way God has things set. He has them set in a perfect order. So it says, and the second commandment is likened to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. You say, well, I understand why we should love God with all our heart, mind, body, and soul, but why does God say we have to love uh, our neighbor as ourselves? Well, doesn't it make sense that if God loved us enough that he, he came and he would have died for me individually, you individually, or, or anybody that you know individually, if God cared for them and loved them that, enough, uh, that much, shouldn't we love them too? So that, that's why the Lord put that in there, that we are to love one another. And it says, nothing or no other commandment is greater than these two commandments. Romans 1 and 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, to suppress means that you try to stop or put an end to. Uh, 
some people may be living uh, in a fairy tale world. I, I don't know, but you are definitely in a day to where they want Christians. They want them to back up in the corner. Really, they'd love to do away with us. Uh, they wanted to shut our churches over the last two years. You can believe that there was a big agenda behind all of this to close our churches. And really what they want us to do is never mention the name of Jesus. Have you noticed people don't have a problem when you say uh, something about God? But when you mention the name of Jesus, that's when they want to get upset. Why? Because people refer to a lot of things as God. They have false gods. Some of them even believe that they're gods themselves or uh, are in some other god besides uh, Jehovah and his son, Jesus. But th the problem comes when you begin to tell them about God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ, because then they know that you don't believe like they do. So they want to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There, there's literally no reason that you can think of that's valid not to serve God. And people say, well, uh, I've got a lot of life. I've got a lot of living to do. And toward the end of my life, I'll accept him right before I die. Well, you know, it, my thinking, if I were God, why would I want to let you into my heaven if you lived your whole life not wanting to serve me? And then right before you died, you wanted to have a talk with me and repent. And, and I know God is merciful, but I think I would be ashamed to, to try to walk in the gates of heaven and just make it in by the skin of my teeth. I want God to know uh, I want to come. I want to be in heaven, but I want to have a relationship with him while I'm living here on earth, and I want to serve him, and I want him to be pleased with me. That's the, uh, you know, over the last 15, 18 years, that's something I've come to realize. You've got some people that uh, they go to church, uh, like members, they go to church for different reasons. Maybe it's a social environment, or maybe they think, okay, this looks good, uh, that I can put this on a, a resume where I go to church or whatever. People want to be associated with church. Um, and then you've got other people, uh, I'll even say this, that uh, ministers that preach, they have a lot of different reasons for preaching. Some of them, it's about power or prestige, or they just look at it like it's a job. Uh, but me, I think about what God has done for me and how unworthy I was and how he saved me and delivered me and how he has created everything around me and what a blessing that he's been to me my whole life. Whether I loved him or not, he always loved me. And uh, when we were faithless, God, the scripture says, was faithful. And, and I thank God for being this way toward us. I don't want to give an excuse. I want to serve God so I can hear him say, well done one day. I, I don't just want to make it in. I want him to be pleased with the service that I gave him here on earth. And it says in verse 23, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Verse 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. We need to follow God's commandments. And pe people say, well, you know, today this is acceptable to live this lifestyle or that lifestyle. Don't, don't listen to the ways of the world. Look at God's word and, and look at your life and make sure that your life lines up with God's word. Amen? Uh, let's go further. Introducing the lesson. There's a question here, and I like this. It says, what is the purpose of my existence? Why am I here? Uh, these questions are basic to our self-consciousness as living, thinking people. The fact is we never find satisfactory answers to these questions until we acknowledge that there is a God who created everything. And we find in his purpose the reason for our existence. So you're not just here by happenstance. God had a purpose and a plan. 
His scripture says, I knew you when you were being formed in your mother's womb. He already had a purpose and a plan for you. You know, you can be you can be in the will of God, you can be doing a good work, but then there's a perfect and submissive will. Uh, we can be a, a submissive to the perfect will of God for our life, and things really work out when we're in his perfect will for our life. It says, so we must acknowledge that there's a God who created everything, and then we find this reason for our existence. Without God, the only conclusion must be that our being has no truly significant or lasting purpose because everything dies, and without God, there is no hope for anything beyond our brief existence here. You know, man's life is like a vapor. Even if you lived 100 years, how many of you hear people say, oh, it's almost Christmas. Seems like we just did that. Time's just flying. And the reason for that, it says in the end of time, God would cut the time short lest the very elect would be deceived. It's almost like it's speeded up. But, uh, you know, the hope that we have in God, Hebrews 10 and 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. The Apostle Paul says, I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that appointed day. Paul's saying, I have placed my eternal security, my very soul, in the hands of God. Why? I'm persuaded he's telling the truth. I'm going to be in heaven with him. Let's look at uh, this discussion uh, of the lesson. It says, creation declares God's glory. The testimony of creation. This is one of the best-known psalms of David because of its content. The first six verses are often cited by biblical scholars as testimony that the whole uh, that the whole creation, by its very existence, bears witness to the reality and nature of God. David said, "The heavens declare the glory of God," referring again to the moon, the stars, and the planets visible in the night sky. Then he added, the firmament showeth his handiwork, referring to the suns and the clouds uh, that are visible against a blue sky during the daytime. Therefore he continued, day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth things, meaning that the testimony of creation to the glory of God is spoken in the light of day and by the lights that shine in the night. The glory of the day is the light, and the light that shines at night are the glory of the night. All these lights proclaim the glory of God who commanded, let there be light. So why are there stars, and, and, and why is there a moon, and why is there a sun? Because God said, let there be, and there it is. And it says, there's no glory in darkness, but God is light. And Christ is light, and God's glory is revealed in the light. Uh, here's a question for application. It says, have you, by observing the natural world around you in the heavens and the sky above, been impressed with the thought that someone had to create all of this? If so, explain. I said, yes, because, and you know, have you ever thought about this? People say, well, it's just, it just happened to be there. There's a big bang or there's this or that. Uh, you know, all I know is there's brilliant stars and galaxies out there with millions of stars probably. Now. I can't even create one. So it tells me that there's a God who created everything that I'm looking at. So yes, I'd say uh, I've been influenced by the elements around me. Let's look further. It says, The power of the Creator is manifested in all that He created, and it's also manifested in the power of His Word to transform our lives. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting or restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, and the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing uh, the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, Therefore, reverence for God is good for us because his judgments about what is right and wrong are true and much to be desired for our own well-being. By means of creation's testimony and by means of his word, God has revealed himself to us. Responding to God's revelation of himself, 
Our prayer should be that our lives in every way will be conformed to God's will for our lives, revealed through his holy word. So you say, why do, why do we study the word? Why do people, Christians, always talk about reading the Bible? Because we want to study the word. The scripture says, study the word to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We want to please God. So how do we know how to please God? We read his word. And we love his commandments. And we uh, we don't just, the Bible says, be not only hearers of the word, but be ye also doers. We actually put them into practice. It says, in what way does believing and obeying the word of God and the Holy Scriptures enable us to experience the power of God as the creator in our own lives? Because when we walk in uh, obedience to God's word, his blessings come on our life. And uh, I don't know about you, but I can tell you, since I became a Christian, my life has been 500,000 times better than it was when I was a sinner. I didn't have any peace. Um, I didn't have any direction. And when I got in trouble, I didn't have anywhere to turn. But now I've got a God that's a very present help in a time of trouble. He specializes in trouble. Amen. So I want to walk in obedience so I can have those blessings of God. It says, response to the word, observing the creation should lead us to the conclusion that there is a God who is the creator. However, because the natural world uh, of the natural world as we see it, it's been changed, it's been degraded by human sinfulness. The creation does not give us clear guidance about how we ought to live to please God. Many people look at the natural world and see only violence, destruction, uh, all of these things that's going on that are caused by sin. And, uh, you know, I've got a song that I love to listen to. I like old music, uh, maybe some songs that other people uh, wouldn't, wouldn't enjoy as much as I do. But there's one song called It's a Wonderful World, and it talks about... Um, the creation of God and all these things. And, and they did an interview with the man that sang that song. And they, he had some young people ask him, said, well, what's so great about it? Why is it a wonderful world? Look at all the starvation and disease and all this. And he said, hey, God didn't do that. God created a beautiful place uh, for us to live in. All these things that you see are, con are consequences of what man has done since he's been here. So God didn't mess up this beautiful place. Uh, the Garden of Eden, there wasn't any thorns or thistles and everything was looking beautiful until Adam and Eve sinned and then it brought consequences into their beautiful environment, amen? So we need, we need to think about that. It says, God's word commands that we be not conformed to the sinful world but be transformed by God's word and his spirit. Christ is our example to follow and not sinful people nor the creation that is marred by sin. Uh, the Lord tells us that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. So we need to find out what God's word is and his will is for our life. Let's read further here. God uh, created to love God. This is in Micah chapter 6 and Mark chapter 12. What does God require of us? Uh, Micah 6 and 8. This verse of Scripture is often referred to as the golden text of the Old Testament. There are 613 commandments of God in the Torah. That's Genesis through Deuteronomy. And 10 commandments underlying all the commandments of God. And two greatest commandments telling us to love God supremely and to love others as ourself. Micah 6 and 8 pulls together in one brief but comprehensive statement what God requires of us. And again, uh, this is one that I quoted a while ago. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. You know, uh, that's one thing we all need to remember. Over our Christian walk, sometimes we forget just how far we had sank and where God had to come to get us. And we, we're not as humble as we used to be. So, Lord, help us to be humble. To do justice means, in simplest terms, to do what is right in God's sight in relation to God, in relation to others, and in relation to yourself. We learn what is right 
in God's sight by knowing the Word of God, which tells us everything we need to know about the what and how of doing what is right in His sight. To love mercy means we are to put love in action by being merciful and forgiving as God is merciful and forgiving toward us and others. You know, we want God to forgive us, but a lot of times we're not willing to forgive other people. But Scripture said, if we don't forgive our brother, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us of our trespasses. So our very salvation is contingent on being people of forgiveness. And that third one, to walk humbly with our God, to me that means we just got to put Him first in everything we do. It says, the one true God, the Creator of heaven and earth, is to be our only God, and we are to love God supremely above everything. Uh, another question for application. Out of the three requirements stated by Micah, which do you find most difficult to do and why? To do justice, to love mercy, or to walk humbly before your God? And I said to love mercy because God totally forgives us, but sometimes we find it hard to forgive other people. But can I tell you something, friend? To get to heaven, you have to forgive others that have wronged you, uh, people who have done all types of things. The Bible says people who say all manner of evil things against you have to forgive them. So let's move forward here again, response to the word. Humans were created by God to love him and to live in fellowship with him, but the Bible makes it clear that willfully sinning alienates us from fellowship with God and deprives us of love for God. The Apostle Paul taught that if we are not saved from sin by God's redeeming grace, we are enemies of God. So the easy thing to me is to just get saved, amen? We don't want to be an enemy of the cross or of God. And it said, and this teaching uh, is confirmed by the words of James and John, to love God and others as we are commanded by Scripture, we must be redeemed from sin and reconciled to God by Jesus Christ. Let me look at another response to the word here. It says, if we fail to acknowledge and worship God the Creator, we nullify the very reason for our own existence as creatures of God. In this world, when, a, uh, when for a plant there is no longer a reason for it to exist, it's rooted up. When there's no reason for a building to exist any longer, it is torn down. All people experience physical death but when a person rejects God and no longer has a reason to exist, the inevitable result of this will be death. Spiritual death, moral, physical, everlasting death. With no hope of eternal life, the scriptures say the wages are the earned consequences. Think about that. When you're a sinner, the wages of sin are the earned consequences. You earn your reward. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God by grace is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6 and 23. Let's look at the call to discipleship and the call to ministry and action. And um, there were a lot of other things I could have read, but we have pretty thoroughly covered those things over the last four lessons, so I, I won't go into those. But the call to discipleship says, Central to God's purpose in calling us by the gospel and the Holy Spirit to become disciples of Jesus Christ is that our character will be formed more and more in the likeness to the character of Christ. In this way, God restores the image of himself in us that has been marred by sin. Let us persevere in seeking to become more Christ-like, more godly in our character. Um, the longer we serve him, year by year by year, the more we should walk in his statutes or his commandments. Our Christian walk should get stronger and stronger and stronger every year that we claim to be a Christian. And if it's not doing that, we're losing ground. We need to start praying and asking God to bless us. Let's look at ministry in action, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. When we believe in God and love Him, it will be evident to others in our gratitude to God. By expressing our gratitude to God in the presence of others, we encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are witnesses of God 
and Christ and those who are unsaved. You say, well, how would I do that? Uh, it can be something as simple as when you go to a restaurant and sit down, you say the blessing over your food, and you don't just say it so other people will hear it. You say it because you are truly grateful to God for his creation and what he gives us. And he gives us our daily bread. He meets our needs and sustains us. And when you thank God for that, other people hear that. And you know, it'll encourage others, or at least it'll make them think, when was the last time that I prayed? So let's be a light. Let's be a witness in the middle of a dark world. God did create this world to be a beautiful place, but it's marred by sin. And there is darkness in it right now. But Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. When I go away, you are the light of the world. So let's stand up and be one light that can be counted. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your creation. All of the miracles that you have done for us, God, those things that we saw, the ones that we didn't even know about, God, you went in front of us and before us. God, we give you praise and honor and glory, Lord. We pray that you will use us, that our light will so shine before men that our heavenly Father, that people will give him praise and honor and glory. We pray that you'd touch our church, our nation, the leaders in our nation, God, we're going through some horrible things in our country right now. There's disease, all kind of things that are happening. People are in discord. There, uh, So many people are at each other's throat politically. Uh, God, I pray that you would bring peace to a broken world, God. And I know your word says in the end of time, they'll cry, peace, peace, and then there'll be sudden destruction. But for a child of God, that means we've already gone home to be with you. And Lord, even though we want to see other people saved, we pray this, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Be blessed, church.